Hello, good morning, everyone, and thanks a lot for being here. Um, my name is Alessandro Pitito, and I work for UMOFA. And UMOFA is uh, the European Market Observatory for Fisheries and Aquaculture Products. What is UMOFA? It's uh, an initiative funded by the European Commission uh, some 10 years ago, 12 years ago now. Um, and it's essentially an observatory that works with data, market data on price and volumes of fish and fish products sold throughout the value chains of all EU member states. And of course, we also have an outlook on the global market as well. And we're here today to talk about COVID-19, as you know. Um, well, um, back in the day, in the early days of the pandemic, um, of course, you know, as any other person or institution working uh, in this sector, um, spent a lot of effort trying to monitor and understand what was happening um, to the sector uh, as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, and now we are more than two years into this pandemic and we feel it's sort of time to stop thinking about the past, uh, the impact, everyone knows what happened to this sector. Uh, I think if you're all here, you must be somehow related to this seafood sector. You perfectly know what the impact was on this sector. And two years into the pandemic, it's probably now high time to focus on something else. Because I know it may sound a bit controversial, but any catastrophe, any economic shock uh, creates destruction, yes, sure, but it also brings about new opportunities. Because we need to change, we need to adapt, we need to be resilient. We heard the word resilient so many times, and in fact it's true. Uh, the sector was profoundly affected by COVID-19, but it also changed a lot through COVID-19. And today we'd like to imagine the future that's going to come after COVID-19, because amidst all of this destruction, uh, there were also some positive changes, some new opportunities opened up after COVID-19. And today we believe it might be a good opportunity to sort of stop and reflect on what this new future, this new normal might look like. So my speakers today, I will have the privilege to interview a terrific panel of speakers um, and uh, I will ask them to focus more on the future than on the past. Then, of course, yes, we need to uh, take a look at what happened, but the focus today is the world that is coming um, after COVID-19. But now, in the interest of time, without further ado, let's start with uh, um, the first guest here. Um, I told you that UMOFA is an initiative funded by the European Commission, and we have the pleasure to have the European Commission here with uh, Christoph van der Weyer, who is policy analyst at uh, um, European Commission, um, Digi Mare, the Director General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. And um, Christoph is the main contact point for UMOFA. And today I'd like to ask Christoph, well, first of all, yes, you're the Commission, you're hosting UMOFA. If UMOFA is here, it's because the Commission is funding it, and the Europe European Commission um, went to great lengths to support the sector in the early days of the pandemic in Europe. And if today, I mean, if the damages were, uh, there were a lot of damages, but the, the Commission uh, clearly lent lend, a hand to the sector. Um, so what I'd like to ask you, Christoph, is what has changed from an institutional point of view, and what did you learn from this um, COVID-19 um, that we could use for future events um, and future shocks and, and so on. Um, the floor is yours, Christoph. Uh, thank you, Alessandro. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, a big thank to the organizers for having invited UMOFA uh, to make this, uh, this conference. Indeed, when we were discussing the content of this conference several months ago, uh, we were very much in this... Um, um, idea that we would be in what we used to call the new normal uh, after one and a half years of uh, a pandemic we could see that uh, most of the sanitary measures and confinement measures were lifted or about to be lifted the market was recovering not really to the levels to the pre-pandemic levels if i may say so but uh, uh, well things were progressing and we were um, like monitoring very closely what were those new markets uh, dynamic uh, to what extent uh, consumers' behaviors would have changed, etc. But the thing is that now uh, that we are doing this, uh, this presentation, we face uh, a new crisis uh, with the Russian aggression on, uh, on Ukraine. 
And therefore, I thought it might be interesting um, to explain you from an institutional point of view, uh, as I, I, I represent uh, uh, the European Commission, uh, how we, what we learned from uh, the previous crisis, how we managed to support uh, the sector uh, in the previous crisis, in the COVID crisis, and to what extent it made us more, uh, I would say, resilient, to use the word that uh, we, we've heard so many times, but also more effective in addressing the consequences of the current crisis. Um, because when the COVID crisis hit the sector two years ago, it hit uh, the whole sector very suddenly and very heavily, but also very differentially, because the fishery and aquaculture uh, sector um, is very complex. Uh, if I may compare to other agri-food sectors, we have very perishable products, fresh products that are mainly destined to the Horeca sector that was almost closed in most of the uh, member states uh, from one day to the other. We, had, uh, we have aquaculture products, we have a limited uh, life storage uh, capacity. We have an industry that is very dependent on imports, including for uh, processed products. So all this uh, made it uh, very difficult. And when the COVID crisis broke out, almost immediately, most of the professional organizations contacted the, the European Commission, um, first of all, to understand what was happening, because they would know what was happening among, among their members or in their country, but not globally or not on the European markets. And secondly, also to seek for help uh, very concretely to receive financial public support to put to inject liquidities in the system because from one day to another uh, payments would stop, market outlets would, would close. And uh, at the same moment, the European Commission immediately took contact uh, of a whole range of stakeholders to understand what they were leaving on the ground and also to understand what they would need from um, a policy and in institutional point of view in order to support them in that crisis. And we came up with immediate measures that were concretely, well, to provide information. So uh, this is the, the main purpose of, of the observatory, but it's a very flexible organization that managed to uh, provide very rapidly quantitative data, but also analysis on the market development that would help the sector to adapt the strategies. And also um, explain, provide guidance to member states to explain how they can very quickly inject money to support the sector within the existing legal framework. So that's, these are measures that could be implemented very rapidly. On top of that, uh, and that required a huge work at uh, institutional level, we adapted the legal basis in order to provide financial support to the sector to compensate for uh, losses, um, um, stop or reduction of production or sales for the aquaculture sector, for the processing sector. Uh, for the temporary cessation of, uh, of uh, fishing activities, uh, for the possibility to resort to the storage aid mechanism for the fishermen, but also for the aquaculture sector. So there was a whole package of measures that could be adapted and put at the disposal of operators quite rapidly. But we must also admit that this was very much improvised, not perfect, and we were very fortunate that at, at that moment there was still um, substantial budget available simply because over the past years member states did not spend uh, the whole budget that was at their disposal to implement uh, the objectives of the common fisheries policy. So we had all institutions, all member states, the sector working in the same direction and eventually we managed to have uh, uh, an effective package of measures. But that was not ideal and at that moment we also realized that we should put in place a more structural mechanism that could be triggered uh, easy, in an in a easier way or faster way. And, um, well, very concretely, at that moment, the Commission elaborated and it was adopted by the co-legislator crisis measures that could be triggered in case an exceptional event would lead to uh, substantial market disruptions. And I must say, at the time when we elaborated these measures, it was still I wouldn't say theoretical, but very hypothetical. And we did not expect that it would be put at test uh, so soon. And it's actually what happened. So uh, when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, we, we had exactly the same situation where the whole sector contacted the Commission to explain, well, we are facing very huge difficulties. We are noticing disruptions at all levels. We had hundreds of fishing uh, vessels lying idle simply because the fuel costs were so high that it became 
uh, virtually unprofitable to go at sea. We had the aquaculture sector, the uh, processing sector facing very high energy costs as direct consequences of, uh, of the war um, that would make the, the business also uh, virtually unprofitable. We had expected shortages of sunflower oil for the canning industry. We had expected shortages of wheat for the fish feed for the aquaculture sector. We had uh, uh, lack of containers. I mean, at all levels of the value chain, we had disruptions. So there, concretely, what happened is that, on the one hand, we had a very obvious exceptional event that, on the other hand, was leading to substantial market disruptions. So there was no doubt we could trigger this uh, crisis mechanism. And one month after the COVID, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, the war in Ukraine uh, broke out, Member states were legally allowed to uh, put money on the table to support the operators of the fishery and aquaculture sector to compensate for um, the income foregone, uh, for the additional costs, uh, and to resort to the storage aid mechanism, uh, all these being direct consequences of uh, the Russian aggression on uh, Ukraine. So, well. This was a bit what I wanted to explain, is that thanks to the lessons learned from the previous crisis where we effectively managed to come up with something but with a lot of effort of improvisation and with a very imperfect uh, setup, uh, we managed to come with much more effective solutions now that could be triggered very easily, only the Commission needed to decide not uh, needing to have the support of the parliament with all the risks that it uh, can bring, uh, not needing to have uh, never-ending negotiations, etc. So after one month, we could mobilize the, the mechanism. So I think that from that basis, we demonstrated that we were able to learn from uh, uh, the previous crisis to be mo much more effective now and, uh, well, to mitigate to a certain extent the consequences of an external shock that strikes again uh, an industry that is uh, slow, that was only slowly recovering from the previous crisis. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you. Thank you. Christophe, and um, well, congratulations for the time management skills. I think it's the first time in history that a speaker uh, <laughs> manages to <laughs> speak within his lot. Um, as I was saying, um, your mouth, of course, focuses on the European Union, but we live in a global economy, and today we also have the privilege to have the FAO here with us, with Odum Lem, who's Deputy Director of the uh, Fisheries Division uh, at the FAO. And Odum, do you I mean, still from the policy angle, there's pretty much the same question as Christoph, but with a global overview. What, what has changed? Yes, but what uh, have we learned and what will remain from this crisis that we can take with us as a positive message? Please. First of all, thank you for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to be here and do my first physical meeting in more than two years. Um, I live in Italy and in Italy we still wear masks so I, I hope you will be able to understand what I say so I'll try to talk clearly. Uh, representing the FAO of course I, I usually speak only about fisheries and aquaculture but, but I think in, in this occasion I also have to speak in a wider dimension of food security in general. I think what we learned in, uh, of COVID, of course, for, for our sector is how fragmented and, and volatile the environment can be and how vulnerable uh, food supply chains can be. So having said that, I, I still think that we were able to, to show that the fisheries and aquaculture sector is, is robust. It managed to withstand these external challenges and we, we managed to, to deliver food, fisheries and aquaculture products to consumers all over the world, despite the, the difficulties that, that we, uh, we, we encountered. Um, I think the situation we are now, because of the, the war in, in the Ukraine, is much worse. Um, because there are a number of additional uh, elements and factors that not only are, are impacting the fisheries and aquaculture sector, but but the overall e economy. And this, of course, is, is leading to a slowdown in, in growth. It's increase, increasing costs, as we heard, for, for everyone. It's reducing the purchasing power of world consumers and therefore the future consumption of fish and fishery products um, as well. But then 
there's also another dimension, uh, and that is for the millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people um, in FAO, we calculate about 850 million people in the world that do not have access to, to adequate food every day. And of course, wi with, with the war and the rising cost, and we, we, we heard, for, for example, well, the, the cost for fuel for the families to cook their food, the, the cost of, of buying food is, is going up. The, the, f the, the cost of cooking the, the food is, is going up going up not only because of energy but because of oil which is used etc so you have all these factors at the same time driving additional hundreds of millions of, of consumers of citizens of the world into in, into a desperate situation and and that of course leads the uh, or forces the the world community to look at additional uh, remedies not only for specific sectors but how to alleviate uh, sort of poverty not only poverty but but hunger so our colleagues in the in the World Food Program that work on you know short term alleviation of, of, of hungry people whatever wherever they are, are, are are getting also an additional need for for funding, um, and, and I think the, these issues are, are are much more severe than than we thought. But what we've learned, I think we've learned the number of policy issues, uh, a number of policy solutions that we will u use again. Unfortunately, some of the ammunition that we had available for all sorts of reasons, for the first crisis, the COVID, we don't have to the same extent anymore because we don't have the fiscal uh, flexibility and, and th that we did have because the, uh, the, uh, the government debts all over the world is much higher. Inflation is, is much higher. The cost of debt is, is, is higher. So we have a number of, of constraints that we didn't have in the, in, in the first crisis. I'd also like to, to mention that if you look long term, we also have the UN uh, 2030 agenda with the SDGs. Uh, this year we have a number of very important uh, milestones. We have a very important meeting in Lisbon in, in June, uh, taking stock of where we are on the SDG 14, for example. And all the SDGs are important. All the targets under SDG 14 dealing with the ocean are important. But, uh, but I think long term there is especially one target under SDG 14 that is incredibly important for all of us, and that is bringing all the world marine stocks up to MSY, uh, maximum sustainable yield where they should be. Today, one third of the fish stocks in the world, marine fish stocks, are overfished, and we have as a world community to bring that down to zero and bring all fish stocks up to where they should be at MSY. I think that is the only way we can really sustainably source from the oceans in the future, and at the same time ensure that what we get from uh, aquaculture still the world's fastest growing food production sector also is able to continue its growth in a sustainable manner. So before I close, I'd just like to mention that 2022 is the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, and we have to recognize the uh, millions and millions of people that deal in the small scale sector, whether it's in capture fisheries or in aquaculture, and their contribution not only to the supplies today, but also to future supplies. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, now, UMOFO is a market observatory, which means that, yes, it's useful to policy makers, such as the ones we've already heard from, but it's also useful to operators in the sectors throughout the entire value chain. So today, uh, we don't want to hear it only for the from the policy makers, no, no offense guys here, but we also hear, want to hear it from the operators, the people who are in the market uh, daily. Um, so my next speaker um, is Esben Sverdrup Jensen, I hope I got the pronunciation okay, pretty much. And Esben is president at the European Association of Producers Organizations. So it's the primary sector production. If we're still eating fish, it's because of these guys. And Esben is also, of course, CEO of the Danish Pelagic Producers Organization. And, well, Esben, yes, your fishers and aquaculture producers were hit almost immediately by the crisis. I think where they were among the first victims financially in this sector. So we know from our work that there were, there were profound changes. People were struggling to remain in, in business. So there were changes in fishing patterns. And from what we monitored, there were a shift, of course, when the 
Horeca sector, the hospitality sector was shut down. A lot of people basically had no market channel. They lost it overnight. So a lot of them turned to selling to consumers directly. We saw an increase in online sales, for instance. The question to you is, yes, please tell us what happened. But again, how much of this will remain? So was this a structural change? I saw in countries, I'm from Italy as well, and in countries uh, as, such as Italy, uh, you know, online shopping for groceries was uh, really a minor part of online spending. But things changed um, during the early days of the pandemic, and we're all wondering now, okay, uh, has it changed for good? How much of this will remain? But let's hear it from Esben. Over to you, please. Well, thank you, and thank you very much for, for the invitation. There's an old cynical saying saying uh, that uh, there's nothing like a good crisis to generate uh, change and development, and I think that we've uh, experienced that uh, very clearly with uh, with COVID, and we're experiencing it right now with the uh, with the situation in uh, in Ukraine and the effects of there. Um, when COVID hit, the first thing as a fisherman, you think, how can I keep my business in operation? How can I supply? or support my family, how can I support uh, the families of, uh, of the crews? And the immediate thing for most fishermen and for our organizations was how do we keep COVID out of the boats? Because once one guy on a boat gets COVID, then you stop producing, right? So that was the immediate uh, effect and we very quickly got operations up and running in, on the boats, in the ports and in the processing industry. And I, I really think that, that a key part of the robustness and and uh, and the, the sector's ability to keep business flowing was the ability to set up systems very quickly to avoid, uh, let's say, massive uh, spread of COVID within uh, within the sector. And uh, there was a tremendous work done and a very high level of ethics and and uh, and commitment to avoiding that situation in uh, in the, in the seafood sector. And I, I, uh, that has to be uh, really has to be recognised. As Audun said, there were, there were lots of uh, disruptions and, and challenges and, and so on, and it's, uh, it's cynical to say that this was a good crisis because people lost their lives, people lost their jobs and so on. But overall, the, the sector uh, showed its robustness, its ability to adapt to different markets, as you said. The Horeca uh, closed down immediately, but we were actually able to transfer that market into to, to retail, to online and so on. The good thing here about fisheries and fish is that people love to eat it, and uh, and we can deliver all kinds of fish. Uh, so uh, so what happened, at least in Denmark, where I'm from, is that once the crisis hit and people were shut down, the first thing they bought before the shops closed down was canned fish. That's a comfort food. It's a security. It's uh, you know, we love it uh, in in a times of crisis. And once the shops opened up again, people started because uh, they were all at home and cooking. So they started buying luxury, quality seafood. A lot of the stuff that would normally go to the Eureka market that you would never see at the local fishmonger was suddenly available to ordinary people. So, and they had a lot more time uh, in their homes cooking and so on. And some of those elements uh, have stayed in the market. So when it comes to uh, direct uh, consumer uh, business and so on, there's a, there's a growing effect. And I think that a lot of small uh, startups and so on have opened up in this in this. Uh, as part of this or on the, in the aftermath of this crisis. And that's something that we see growing online. The effectiveness of uh, the online whole online market is also in seafood. I mean, you can order a fish today on an app. I have an app uh, here and I can pick it up uh, uh, later this afternoon if I was back in, in Copenhagen. It's amazing. Uh, and it's, uh, so there's, a, there's some positives there. And, uh, and the good thing is that people love to eat uh, uh, food. When they, they, when it's a crisis, and when they want to, uh, they feel that they uh, deserve a little bit of spoiling, and and that was what we saw in the in the, in the market. The question, of course, is can we uh, can we uh, can this robustness continue uh, through the current crisis, which is a different in nature? Uh, it's very much about fuel. A lot of uh, a lot of boats are right now tied up in ports. They simply cannot operate with the with the cost of fuel. That, of course, will kick off or uh, speed up the, the, the green transition that we all uh, want and need. But we need some technological developments in order to transition from fossil fuels in the sector into green fuels. The technology is simply not there right now. But hopefully, this crisis will, uh, will accelerate that development and make us, uh, put us in a position to, uh, to answer those, uh, those issues that, that Auden uh, mentioned on the, uh, on the um, the SDGs, etc. 
The important part in that is that this, the sector is very diverse. I'm the CEO of the Danish Pelagic uh, producer organization. Some of the most modern and, and sophisticated vessels in, in the world, probably. But I also, as uh, president of the APO, represent thousands of the small-scale uh, fishermen and, uh, and so on. They don't necessarily have the technology, and the finances, and so on, to transition into greener technology on the short term. So we need to make sure that we bridge the gap between now and the time when we can actually deliver on, on those. And we need, that's where we need support. And we need an effective system. We have the opportunity in, the, in Europe right now to have a look at the, at the common fisheries policy. Originally, this common fisheries policy was developed to, uh, to, let's say, protect the market. Over the years, it has, for good reasons, turned its focus towards sustainability and protecting life uh, in the ocean. And, and some of the tools that we used to have as POs are gone now. If this happened uh, 15 years ago, I had the tools to go out and buy all of the fish that my members caught with support from the EU system. Buy it, turn it into fish meal. Uh, so we would have been, uh, been alive, I say, everybody with the minimum price system. That's not necessarily a healthy system, but we had the tools in the past. Uh, we don't necessarily have those tools anymore. But we have some of the legislation is still in place that came from a, a different time when focus was on the market. And we have to use the opportunity right now when we are reviewing the, the CFP uh, to take a close look at the legislation and, 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 and say, does, does this legislation provide what fishermen need to allow them to transition into a more greener uh, technology to continue uh, through a similar crisis in the, in the future where we don't necessarily have the financial support from uh, governments and so on because they're also struggling. Uh, so a critical review of the CFP is necessary uh, right now to, s to take a close look at how can y how much leverage does a, the individual fisherman have to adapt his business, to develop new uh, uh, technology, to take it on board? Uh, there are lots of limitations that stem from a different time, and we need to sort of move the CFP into uh, uh, current, uh, current time. I think that that's the most important thing on our agenda right now to, let's say, build on what we've learned from COVID and what we're learning right now from, uh, from the situation in Ukraine. I hope I stayed within the time slot. <laughs> no, uh, I'm impressed with all of you, actually. It's uh, great to be moderating a workshop like this. Um, so, last but not least, let's change angle again, still from the sector. We have uh, Roberto Alonso from Anfaco eh, Cecopesca, so from, from Spain. And Anfaco Cecopesca, for the non-Spanish, uh, is the um, basically represents the processing the seafood sector and notably the processing sector um, in, in Spain and uh, well Roberto I would say that with you um, everything is interesting here but I'm particularly interested in your in your words because I remember when we started monitoring the um, impact of COVID-19 on this sector the impact on the processing sector was somehow one of a kind because we noticed at first that for obvious reasons the sales of processed food were booming compared to um, fresh seafood. No, for obvious reasons, it, they, it, uh, it fits better with a lower shopping uh, frequency, a shelf life is longer, um, and people wanted to shop less, so they hoarded on foodstuff, foodstuffs, and processed food was just a, seemed to be the perfect solution. But, but the world is never as simple. So um, just please let us know again, the question is always the same how much of these changes will remain and what else happened? I mean, I, I know that it wasn't just that. It wasn't just, uh, you know, a bed of roses. But so, please, let's hear it from you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Petito, for, for the invitation. While I'm putting a quick and brief presentation to all of you just to answer some of the questions that Mr. Petito has made to me. Yep. So... I would like to invite you to all of you a very quick image. Come back, please, to March 2020. The COVID-19 gets on the floor in Europe and the, quiz, the processing sector, I represent the Spanish, but also I will talk a little bit about the European perspective for the processors. How are we going to create value when predictability is over? 
In that period, everything stopped here in Europe, and we need to continue manufacturing all the products that go through the retail, and we don't know what will happen. So we have to manage the chains. We learned something from there. First point, the transport routes, the logistics were gone. We can't put our products from one transport from one point to another because the borders were closed. So our trucks were there two days in some cases. The, 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 the crew can go to the, to the gas stations to have shower, to lunch. It was impossible. And we exporting to more than 140 clients around the world. So Sadly, some of our clients didn't receive their, their cargo, but others, of course, yes. Second point, we have unknown flows. The supply and demand were terribly a mess. We work day, in some cases weekly, the, the, the lucky, but day by day. The supply, we don't know if the has, say, has been the crew have COVID, we don't know the, the ports, the people there to, to have for or, or supplies, so we don't know exactly where to look out. We need to find out new origins, we need to use the tools available, and plus more than that, the demand. We have one week here in Spain that the kind of products in Spain demanded more than 80% one week compared to previous years. That's absolutely the environment we're trying to talk about it. And if we look, like, for example, for the March consumption of, of seafood, we see that how in the whole month for March, we have to deliver to our clients 21% more only in Spain. But if we're talking about exports, this is, for example, the Spanish exports of fish products. We think that the kind of products, of course, went good. The cell life was an added value. But also Christians, also, for example, the smoked fish. And that's why we're talking about. Probably nowadays, after the COVID pandemic, we see that certain products remain an answer to these questions. But more importantly, has they mentioned the, the, the value of the products. We are facing a premiumization of the consumers. The consumers wanted quality, wanted to spend more because they can go to the outside. So, as you know, fresh, fresh freeze in your home makes you happy. So, of course, we need to face down the product personal equipment. They don't have masks, gloves, they have hydroalcoholic gels. Think about it. We develop also solutions for this. Of course, in Spain, Europe, lately legislation, the European Commission was quite fast putting the compensation mechanisms, but in Spain, we also have daily legislation. Saturdays, Sundays, I remember everything changed day to day, and these are, com are completely a mess and impacted in our competitive environments because it impacted in your clients, impacted in your supply, impacted in your people. So it was a terrible mess. And the last point, just to mention, this was the workers. Imagine a woman going to a factory working through a motorway, no one's there, always closed. But these people feel fear, fear about the COVID, fear about going to work, and we also need to face that. And this is it. This is what we achieved. No, this is what we achieved. We avoided this on retailers. Europe was plenty of food, plenty of canned, plenty of frozen, plenty of fee food in general. At least during COVID, this is a photo from the recent trampol strike here in Spain. So this is what we got today. <laughs> so we need to manage the change. What we learn from that? First point, collaborative logistics. We develop new routes. We work together just to find out how to, to fool the cargo and to better and be more competitive on that, also to work with the administration for that. Second point, we develop internal mechanisms, all the factories. We develop systems that 15 minutes uh, express meetings to solve daily to day uh, the, this, the, the, the crisis that we face each day, and this is all today applied continuously. So we're, we're more effective, more productive, more executive mechanisms. Third one, of course, energetical initiatives develop new production systems. Some companies, for example, have textiles uh, factories that transport to produce masks. So this is an, an industrial adaptation to the change. And I think industrial relocation is now at stake. European Commission, Next Generation Funds, trying to reindustrialize Europe, trying to make it more uh, competitive, and that's what we're doing right now. Maybe it's a change in the worldwide and the global context. Of course, uh, associations like Anfaco were critical to this point. The, the people need uh, uh, how solutions, how they can put their export problems. We help them. How with the administrations, we help them. How we can solve certain points when they have their COVID technician at home, we have technicians, we help them. So that's the thing, that was one of the good points, for example, at least for Amfac on this kind of situation, because you know the good associations make the, the step back make a, a difference. And lastly, and not least, the virtual platforms. We're used to Zoom, to Teams, whatever platform do you want. I think the R&D, the commercial, the people learn to, 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 to work in these hybrid mechanisms, and if now we're trying to be more productive with them. This is, for example, I think today we can leave this, uh, follow this meeting through. But March 2022, 
Each March is happening something. March 2020, COVID. March 2021, evergreen blocks the Suez Canal. March 2022, sadly, this is not happy. Russia attacks Ukraine. But now, this is what we're facing. How to cre create value, but also to capture value in this, in this time. This continues. The COVID is, isn't ending. So this is the, the reason of all of the, the difference that this situation previous to the COVID situation, the inflation is on top in Spain, close to 10%. So sadly for us, our mass consumers are European market. For Spain, for example, 80, 70% of our products are being exported to the European Union. And what are saying the European uh, Union consumers, Eurobarometer, during COVID, more the same, they're consuming the, the same seafood products. They spend a little bit more value, but in general, they're consuming the same. Yellow is the same, blue more, red less, so we're not paying mass, mass, uh, mass uh, clients. So the challenge is quite clear. How to produce new added value in this private, in this price prioritization of consumers? They are looking for the money. The private levels are also on top. This is a problem for the value chain because 70, 80% are private labeled in certain categories. Their supply is currently non sunflower oil. I won't talk about that now, but 70% of sunflower oil in Spain came from Ukraine. What happened next year? And third point is more important the energy system that we are now facing. We're going to do with that. And of course, the transport might defeat. Talk about candle kind of sweat, talk about evergreen, whatever you want, but it's on the top and it's not going down. So, what's the solutions? First point, focus your strengths. We're talking that the European consumers are our main target, so defend it. Grow on them. Probably most of you don't know, but the 50% of the canned tuna consumed in EU are coming from third countries. So, there's potential in growth there. So, also, how we can do it? First point, demanding a level playing field. Are the third countries applying the same rules? This is a very huge and long topic, but we can talk about it later. And to focus on, on our key competitive. That is competitive raw material. If we're looking for new ori origins, the autonomous tariff quotas, for example, was a clear solution of we use them to provide food to the retailers. If we don't have these tools, probably European consumers won't have the opportunity to have this food. Of, so, of, of course, to innovate permanently, the consumers need to be trusted, need to be surprised, even in a price prioritization system. So put values, we have values to put, sustainability, social, gender equality also. Uh, sensual, new, new recipes, freshness, uh, the portions adapted to the single families, all is changing. Trying to put, of course, less salt, less sugar, less fat, absolute, absolutely. But the most important is to sustain the momentum of trust. The European consumers put trust in us. Put trust that they can find food in their sales and in one people that I provide to them something that is good, it's a good price, and it's something that they wanted. So we increase our exporter, we need to sustain it, good, competitive, with good innovation. Just to make a remark, the, something talk about the, the online channels. This is not the main channel, but also there are certain consumers that started to use it during the pandemic. They can go to retail, so they learn to use the internet for buying these this, this, this products. And for example, for January to September in Spain, in the online channel, the general seafood categories are double. So the people are starting to use it, and probably this is not the, the key solution, but it's a first uh, step trying to develop online business to consumer directly through your company, and maybe in the metaverse, Facebook, these people develop, this is an opportunity, just a first step to adapt to these new environments. But more importantly, and just to finish, uh, I need when the, in these times with predictability is over, we need to reconsider continuously our market plans. We don't know what will happen the next week. March 2023, I'm <laughs> happy to, to wait a good situation at least, or a better situation like Nano. But think about, we need to lead by principles to, to our team. This is very important about people here. It's usually we're talking about seafood, it's perfect, but our teams, the people that achieve the solution to put the, the, the seafood in your markets are people. And you need to lead by purpose, with principles, because all the problems that we face, these people, was they want to give you the solution. And of course, to build the strongest alliances. Today is a perfect place to build these alliances, because as, as processors, probably as a, as a company, somebody, someday you will fail. That's normal, because we don't know what will happen next week. But if you are a, a person in who you can trust, you are a company in which client trust, probably you will find a next day and a next uh, deal with this, these people. And that's where the European processing industry is now, being somebody, being a company in which you can trust. Thank you very much. So thank, thank you very much for this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, now, before 
we open the floor for, for questions from you. Um, let me remind you that uh, you can hear all of these, well, the, the workshop itself is going to be recorded, but uh, if you visit UMOFA, there's a free website, UMOFA, E-U-M-O-F-A dot E-U, you can visit us online, you can find all of our publications, our previous events, webinars, workshops, you can find a lot of data on the entire value chain of fish and aquaculture products. So, and we also happen to have a stand. Uh, we are in hole number three, and the stand is G, G like Germany, um, or Girona for the Spanish, 100. I'm saying it again, hole number three, G100. You just, just drop by and we'll be there for you to answer all of your questions and to explain how this whole observatory works. So, enough now with the speakers and with this side of the room. Now, we'd like to open the floor. Um, okay, let me finish first. No, I'm joking. We already have a question, two questions. So, okay. Uh, it's a small room, so I think I can manage, and I need to stretch my legs anyway. So, you were here first. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my particular interest is in um, canned, canned seafood. Um, what I think is, like, during, obviously, the pandemic and... The, the time when you know people are very squeezed in terms of their finances and trying to save money, um, have long long lasting seafood. For instance, I think canned tuna was very, I guess, very popular during the time. But do you see this still continuing during the current climate? And my second thing is, given that I think it's quite hard to innovate in terms of canned products. I mean, I've seen, for instance, some John West uh, are looking at some products where they're saying, you know, health benefits such as long life or heart or heart issue, or, or, you know, you can help help the heart or there's other health things. But I think for personally, it's quite hard to add these type of value additions to canned products. Because essentially, particularly in the UK, I think canned tuna is not necessarily seen as a premium or something that people would pay extra for. It's more as a I would say generally it's a cheaper product, which is not necessarily what we would call a premium compared to, I know in some countries, for instance, canned tuna, canned fish is very much more of a premium and, and you get the albacore, which is seen, it's packaged very nicely. It has its glass tins and it looks very, very good. But in the UK, particularly, canned tuna is still seen as relatively, I'd say low level and not that high value. I was just wondering how how, how we could, I don't know, change the perception of these type of fish, the canned can, can tuna particularly. So, I guess it's a question for you, yeah. Roberto. Can you confirm? Yeah, oh. think it's on wire. It's from here. yeah thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. I, I didn't hear your name. Sorry. Ivy, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think it's a very interesting uh, point that uh, probably if I ask you about another segments like the wine, for example, do you think the wine is cheap or expensive? Wine, wine for example, wine, you know, red wine. Probably some of you will depend. It, it depends. They're cheap wine, the expensive wine. But I would like to point here is that for the kind of two that is a market development, there is a, a, a some uh, some actions that we're developing to do that because, as you perfectly mentioned, depending on the country. There are people who think there's a low cement, a commodity. Yeah? But that is changing. That is changing. How we can change that? Of course, the first point is to, to work collaboratively to put more effort in the added value of what we're putting on the table of our consumers. Because one of the main interest points is that the canned tuna, as you perfectly could know, you can find a canned tuna that is low quality and high quality. You can find it in the market. Absolutely. And you can help the consumer how to understand that. How we can do it? First point, we can innovate in this segment. Of course, I will pick your, your uh, examples. We can innovate, as I put there. Now, uh, putting more values in your products. Origin level, social leveling, is, you know, giving more uh, emotional uh, purchasing to your consumer, giving them more reasons to buy your product. That's an innovation put there, and the consumer is going to be feel that they're close to this product. 
put in, for example, in Spain we have some eco labeling, with social labeling. Now, see initiatives for gender equity. You know that in Spain most of the canned tuna are manufactured by women. There are people are putting that into 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 there. For example, for the anchovies, this is another segment. Anchovies uh, in Spain, the the, the the woman put their name on the on the on the can inside the can. You can find trying to you know, customize the product. This is one way. Another way is to, to, to develop the recipes. I think a lot of people only thinking uh, sunflower oil tuna, you know, you know, that's the, there are a lot of them. In Spain, for example, the olive oil is a quite differentiation brand. There are some initiatives, but also to develop the, the sauces, the regional sauces, new recipes. That's also a way to increase the product. And the perception of the consumer about, about the products, it depends on how you present to them, how the alternatives they have, and how the information I'm going to, to have on that. And you have to mix it up. It's a very difficult perspective. In the UK, we know the market quite well. Now, as you probably know, due to the Brexit, uh, it's more difficult to the European uh, canners to put uh, their, 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 their products there because, you know, the origin, we can talk about how the Atuna now is, is moving through the Brexit thing. But uh, we need to invest. If you work there, we need to invest in promotions. Here in this fair, we have a lot of uh, promotion events. And most of that, all of that, I think, for example, uh, and this is a message to the European Commission they have here, we need to be very careful about the next actions, for example, for Nutri-Score scheme. I would like to end with this because I know it's having a lot of time. But this Nutri-Score scheme is for Digi Sante. But Nutri-Score puts, for example, for a can of sardines in, in, in sunflower, a D letter. And it's not. Uh, it's not true. The kind of sardine is a very nice product. It's given to hospitals in France. So people are ill because have omega-3 have a lot of uh, interest compounds. So be aware of the nutrition facts. This is the last point, and this is a message to the European Commission, because these kind of things also could help us or be against us in this market development that you, you speak. But if you want, after this conversation, we can try to, to spread because it's a very difficult issue. Thank you. Husband. Yeah, just, just very briefly, because this is a, it's an interesting discussion. I mentioned the canned food uh, as, as, as like a comfort thing that people <laughs> buy when <laughs> in the times of crisis, in Denmark at least. But actually over the last uh, year or so, I don't know if there's a direct connection with COVID and so on, we've seen that quality canned products have moved into the Danish market. Normally it would be like a very cheap uh, thing, mackerel, tomato sauce, that's sort of the main thing, 98% of it. But actually if you, you should take a trip to Copenhagen, go into a cafe, Sit down. People are eating sprats, sardines, anchovies out of the can with a little bit of bread. It's something that's developed within the last uh, few uh, years. Really, canned food has become a, a, uh, something, at least for the, for the, uh, for the consumers in, in, the, in the bigger cities and so on. It's a thing. And, uh, and I don't know where we picked it up, probably from going to Spain and other places where they have quality canned uh, food, because it was not on the market right now. And we're also seeing local producers in Denmark picking up like, sprat from the, from the Baltic that would normally only go to markets in Poland and Russia and so on now in the, in the market. And it's, it's, it's become a, a sexy thing, in the, in the, at least in, in Denmark. So, so you can sort of turn it around, uh, telling the right story, uh, uh, wrapping it in, uh, in, uh, in, in a nice way and, uh, and, of course, making sure that the product inside the, the can is, is high quality. It's really super hard to uh, to say. I, I, you know, it could be sort of you know there are different trends and fads and in in consumer and in in, the, in the and so on. So there's it's, there's not necessarily a, a direct link. I've just seen that there's an overlap in in terms of times and and actually that that what we've talked about is so fantastic when we travel to Spain and Portugal and so on and France where you can get like high quality canned food that's actually now accessible and even locally produced in in Scandinavia, which is a, it's a great thing, and I'm sure that the UK can, uh, can experience the same kind of development. Yeah, but, but important point that you make is during COVID pandemic, the people can go to the Oreca channel, so they spend a little bit more money in the, f in the fish products, in the seafood products. Uh, of course, it's, uh, sadly to say, but they spend more in canned products, and they learn more about different styles, not the typical kind of tuna that you mentioned, but new recipes, new presentation, new formats, and that's good because now they know that they are more 
in the in the canned fish uh, sector. They they can buy and they can uh, test, and this is what we're looking right now. Good. Oh, Alden, please. J just one one, uh, one one small comment. Um, ev every time I I participate in the Info Fish Tuna Conference in Bangkok, which is held every two or three years, th this question comes up, and, and it's a very it's a very good question, and I think. There's no clear answer to it. I think we've heard a, a number of initiatives and proposals how to sort of move the product perception in the market from, from one place to another. But it takes a lot of investment from the industry itself. It takes a lot of marketing and advertising and promotion. But also it takes a lot of investment in the product. I mean, you have to improve the product. Uh, very often in certain markets, you mentioned the UK, but there are other markets as well, that the main competitive element has been price and you know if everyone is just competing on price then of course the, the quality of the product is is going down and in the end the consumers are, are, are not happy so you have to invest both in promoting the product in innovation uh, and, and and quality and I think there are a number of examples that we've heard that it is possible but it depends very much on the perception of the product in the specific market well. Main, main takeaways for the organizers, let's rename it as Canned Seafood Expo next year, maybe. <laughs> uh, I saw some hands raised from this corner, please. Um, thank you very much for your presentations. I just had a quick question uh, for Christoph and uh, one for Esben. Christoph, can you put some figures on the kind of um, in budget that your that the EU Commission has put in place or is spending for these protections for in this um, new uh, system to protect the uh, fishing industry from these crises, and um, if Esben, if you could just uh, specify some of the policy changes that you were asking of the EU in regard to the common fishery policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, in terms of figures, actually, no, it's not, uh, well, it's not possible to put figures simply because there are no ceilings as, as such. It's left to all member states now to elaborate and to decide on the uh, criteria on the basis of which operators uh, may come up and say and justify the fact that they are incurring additional cost or they lost income due to the uh, uh, Ukrainian crisis. Uh, from that moment, member states are free to allocate as much money as they feel is necessary to mitigate the impact of the crisis and uh, keep uh, the business uh, running, basically. So there is no, um, uh, I would say, an envelope or budgetary uh, amount that was decided uh, to be allocated to uh, alleviate the, the consequences of the crisis. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, excellent question. As I said before, I mean, the originally uh, the CFP or the Common Fisheries Policy was designed very much to protect the market and the fishermen against uh, bad prices. In exchange for that, fishermen had to accept certain limitations on how to develop their businesses, including, for example, a a a, um, a ceiling on capacity. So there's a, there's a, there's a ceiling on how big the the European fleet can be in total, and in for each member state. That maybe have made sense in a certain time, especially before we had uh, real quotas and so on. Now, if you want to transition into green technology, if I want to change from diesel into uh, ammonia or something else in, in a vessel, I would need a tank that is at least double the size uh, to have the same amount of, uh, of fuel on board. So you need a bigger boat doesn't help you fish any better, but you need a much bigger boat to, let's say, have to, uh, to adapt to, to green technology. But because of the capacity ceiling that was put in place back in the days, I'm not allowed to build that boat. I can't build that boat. Or if I want to, I have to free up capacity somewhere else in the sector. So I would have to buy up some of these small-scale fishermen that we are celebrating this year. I'll get rid of the, their boats to free up capacity to allow me to build a modern vessel that can run on green fuels that I also, because that's what I need to deliver on in terms of the, the SDG goals, etc. So there's a conflict there within the policy that we, if we want to be uh, modern, if we want to allow ourselves to transition into green technology, but at the same time keep the diversity 
of the fishing fleet. We need to change those structural uh, issues within the policy and allow us to, uh, to, uh, to develop. So that's just one example, and there's a multitude of, uh, of things that we're working with from, from my organization, with the Commission, uh, and with member states in, in relation to the, uh, the, the, the review of the, the common fisheries policy. But this is one that is really a, just blocking our ability to transition into green technology. Brilliant. Um, any more questions? No? Have a Okay, we have a question over there. Thank you. Thanks, that was great. Um, I'm interested to hear more about the increase in the direct sales from fishermen to um, consumers. It seems like there might be, is there a push from industry to support that? Or it seems like industry might be a little conflicted in terms of um, would they be missing out on like processors and intermediaries if there's direct sales. So I guess is there support from the seafood industry to promote those direct fishermen to consumer sales or is there a little hesitation about kind of what the implications of that direct um, sales would mean for the in, for other players in the chain? Thanks. Uh, who was the question for? Um, Anyone? Yeah. Yes. I can, I can start since I mentioned this. Please. I mean, Things are moving pretty quickly when it comes to the market right now and to some of the technology, some of the logistics. I mean, everybody's buying any, everything online and you can have it delivered for free the next day or this afternoon. It's incredible and not necessarily healthy, all of it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that things are really moving extremely quickly. So some of the original channels and different uh, sort of paths that a, a fish would need to travel through the system to get to you or to me, uh, that has completely changed. Uh, there are still some structural issues in, in different countries on how you have to sell your uh, fish through an auction and so on. All of that can be uh, be looked at, but it's. I don't think there's a. Uh, I mean, with all change, there's hesitation and so on. But there's also a huge potential here, especially for some of these small-scale uh, vessels that provide a unique product uh, that, uh, but are struggling with the traditional channels. So, if you can get that product to a certain specific niche market, there is a potential for added value that might be necessary when you're struggling with fuel prices and everything else. That's not necessarily the solution for the whole market. You need to push some volumes also. And, uh, and uh, so different solutions for different, uh, for different parts of the market. Do you Absol agree? Absolutely. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one more quick question. If any of you can make your conference pass fee worth it? Okay, we have one. Uh, thank you, uh, just one more question. On the level playing field, um, I think all, several of you referenced that on leveling the, the playing field uh, so that EU fishery industry can compete on a living level playing field. Who exactly are you ref, uh, pointing to and um, what is happening perhaps at the EU Commission level to level the playing field? Are there things happening in that regard? Well, first of all, it's always good to remember that um, more than two thirds of the uh, fishery and aquaculture products we consume in the European Union are imported from third countries. So, and this is, this is what makes it very diff different to other agri-food sectors where we are much more self-sufficient. And there, the, lab the level play playing field uh, is ensured by um, the obligations that are made to all products that are sold on the European market to comply with the same rules uh, in terms of uh, uh, well, the sanitary rules, but also the, la the labeling uh, rules, so the co uh, information to the consumers. All country, all products, whatever their origin, must comply with the same rules. So from that point of view, there is no difference between a product imported from a third country to a product uh, from a uh, European uh, origin. So that's the main issue. Of course, there are um, competitive advantages on which we are less equipped, which are we cannot be um, settled by the law, uh, 
which are the cost of productions, etc. Uh, but this is more, uh, I would say, a business, uh, a business issue than a, a, legal, uh, a legal issue. Uh, but this is why, and I come back to what was said earlier, uh, in Europe, differentiation is probably uh, what we should work on. The fact that we have products, uh, short circuits, products of very high quality, a wide range of products, because most of the products that we consume uh, for the time being are salmon, tuna, shrimps, etc. But uh, our fishermen are landing a wide variety of fishes, so we should make efforts to promote those products, which is good for the conservation issues, but also good for uh, our fishermen's uh, businesses. Thank you very much. Now we're just about to close, just 50 seconds left. Uh, 10 seconds each, uh, your positive message for the future. Mine is, let's remove March from the calendar. But Christoph, please. <laughs> no, well, I think that we've seen over these last couple of crises, and on top of which I would add the Brexit, that the, the industry was very resilient, that the proximity with the institutions makes it more easier to, to, uh, to go on uh, and visit the future. Yeah, I would absolutely like to support uh, Christoph because I think the processing industry is, is somebody and someone is a sector in, in who you can trust. Well, just uh, keep in mind that fish is absolutely wonderful and uh, the best thing you can eat in terms of uh, health, in terms of climate and most importantly in terms of, uh, of taste. And, and sometimes we forget that with oh, everything that's going on uh, around us, at least in the sector, is that you know, it's a fantastic product. Eat more of it. It's a fantastic product and it's good for you. However, in order to be able to ensure that the future generations of the world are able to consume fish just like we are, we have to ensure that fishing capture fisheries are sustainable, get them out to MSY, control subsidies and also allow aquaculture to prosper. Thank you. Thank you very much all of you and remember umofa.eu, whole three stand G100. Until next time, thank you very much. Very good. good, yeah. Very good. Uh, the, the lying of the messages. <laughs> Absolutely.